Good morning. Second Corinthians 12 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I ask that you stand as we begin worshiping Christ this morning. welcome you in Jesus name and those of you watching online we welcome you as well 
Pray that the Lord will encourage you and strengthen you as we worship the Lord together this morning. Just want to highlight one announcement for those of you who are part of our congregation. We have our Thanksgiving service on the 22nd of November, Sunday evening, the Sunday evening before Thanksgiving, 6 o'clock. It is a time of singing, a time of testimony. So if you'd like to be a part of the service, uh, sharing a word of testimony or singing, playing an instrument, whatever, we'd love to uh, have you be a part of that special evening. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are joyful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you have done for us. Uh, the many ways that you have blessed us, the many ways that you have provided so graciously for us. We thank you most of all for Jesus, for that gift of salvation that you have provided for us and your Son. And we thank you, Lord, for the promise of your word that along with him you will freely give us all that we need. And so we praise you and thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather together this morning to worship you. And we pray that our worship today would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, and that the name of Jesus would be lifted up in this place. Father, thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. Uh, we will rejoice and be glad in it. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Our confession of sin is taken from Psalm 51. Would you bow with me as we together confess our sin? Be gracious to me, O God, according to your faithfulness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Wipe out my wrongdoings. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my wrongdoings, and my sin is constantly before me. God promises us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I invite you to stand as you are able for our scripture reading this morning. It's taken from the book of Acts, chapter 20, and reading verses 17 through verse 24. Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 17. From Miletus he sent word to Ephesus and called to himself the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was beneficial and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit solemnly te testifies to me in every city, saying that chains and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of God's grace. Would you join me in confessing our faith? together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This next song we're about to sing is about fixing our eyes on Jesus and finishing the race, just like the scripture pastor just said. I want to read from you from Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Let's continue worshiping this morning. Faith, we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, our fathers roam.
fight the good fight and finish the race for you, Lord, glorifying you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So what do you think is easier, starting the race or finishing the race? It's a little tougher to finish, isn't it? It's easy to start, and there's a lot of people that have had a good start running the race. But I'll tell you what, uh, finishing is really the challenge. And the, the text we look at this morning uh, deals with that, where Jesus speaks of uh, finishing. Uh, no one putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 9, we begin reading at verse 57 and read through verse 62. Luke 9, starting at verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the airs have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. And Jesus said to him, No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this word that you've given to us today, this uh, challenge in terms of serving you. And Lord, I pray that you would enable us as we uh, commit ourselves to follow you, Lord Jesus, to, to finish the race that you have given to us. Thank you, Lord, that your grace and strength is enough for us. You are enough for us, and you can give us the power to not only start well, but to finish. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I read a story about a ship that was really in a terrible storm out at sea. And the captain of the ship gave an SOS, and there was another ship not far from there, kind of in the harbor. And as it began to make its way out into the sea, uh, the storm uh, got even worse. And there was someone on that ship coming from the harbor that went to the captain and said, Turn around, turn around. If we go any farther, we'll never come back. And here's what the captain said. He said, turn around. Did you say turn around? He said, never. Our obligation is to go, not to come back. Turn around? Are you kidding me? We don't turn around. You know, when it comes to following Jesus, this is the commitment that we are called to make, isn't it? There's no turning back. <laughs> Now, this is how Jesus put it, no one putting his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, there are three men in this passage that really illustrate uh, this commitment that the Lord calls us to make to him. And first of all, notice there is no turning back for the sake of earthly comfort. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, we're told. And a man approaches him, and he says to Jesus in verse 57, I will follow you wherever you go. Now that looks like a, a pretty good statement, right? And in fact, it's kind of a remarkable statement. For one thing, Matthew tells us that this came from a scribe. Matthew chapter 8, verse 19. If you know anything about scribes, they were uh, not really Jesus' uh, friends. They were not cheering him on. Uh, they were amongst the, the group of religious leaders who, who really opposed Jesus. So to hear this from a scribe, that's kind of remarkable. That was not the norm by any stretch of the imagination. 
But what is even more remarkable is what he said. He said, I will follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. So here was a man who appeared to be a tremendous prospect for becoming a disciple of Jesus. And I think if we would have been there, we might have been tempted to say, get on board, sir. We need all the disciples that we can get. But Jesus saw something in this man that caused him to question whether he really understood what he was saying. And this is evident in the way that Jesus responded to him in verse 58. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, if you think that following me is going to be easy, you don't understand what it means to be my disciple. The road that I take is going to take you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> I think that's what Jesus is saying. It is not going to be an easy life. This man must have seen the crowds, the miracles. He saw the fanfare, all the excitement, all this attention at this point that Jesus was being given and thought, I would love to get in on that. That would be great. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Seemed like a good idea. To be associated with the one who was the center of all this attention. Richard Lenski says he sees the soldiers on parade, the fine uniforms, and the glittering arms, and he is eager to join, but he forgets the exhausting marches and the bloody battles. So Jesus needed to tell this man that following him may not exactly be what he thought it would be. And as you follow Jesus in his earthly ministry, you can see what that road was like. In Jerusalem, they wanted to kill him. John 5.18, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. In Galilee, People withdrew from Jesus. John chapter 6, verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. In Gadara, remember that? When that demon-possessed man who was living in the cemetery, was, life was changed and those pigs went down over the cliff into the water. What did they say to Jesus? Matthew 8, 34, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. Get out of here. We don't want you here. In Samaria, people refused Jesus' lodging in chapter 9, verse 53 of Luke, but they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. This is what it was like to follow Jesus. This is what he is telling this man as he claims he'll follow Jesus anywhere he goes. He wants him to know what it is going to be like. It is not at all what this man probably thought it was. This wasn't the only time that Jesus responded in a way like this. In John chapter 12, at the feast of Passover, there were these Greeks that came to the feast and they came to Philip and they said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And we would think, well, that sounds wonderful. And so Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip, they come to Jesus. And they tell Jesus, there's the Greeks. They want to see you. And it's very interesting to notice how Jesus responds to that. He didn't say, great, welcome, tell them to come. Verse 23 of John 12, Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. What did Jesus say to these Greeks? He's saying, do you understand what it means to follow me? There is a cost of discipleship, and if you're going to follow me, you need to count the cost. Jesus never 
did a bait and switch, right? It is going to be wonderful. It is going to be marvelous. The crowds are going to be following us. It's going to be just great. He said, if you want to follow me, here's what it is. You need to count the cost of discipleship. So what happens when we count the cost of following Jesus? Now for some of us, when we count the cost of following Jesus, we immediately recognize our weakness, right? We understand how much we need Jesus, and we cry out to him and say, Lord, help me. <laughs> help me to finish the race. Help me to keep going. Help me not to turn back. Lord, help me to keep running. You know, this is what Peter didn't quite understand, did he? He was so confident in his own ability to even lay down his life for Jesus. John chapter 13, verse 36. Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Remember what Jesus said? I'll paraphrase it for you. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me. How many times? Three times. Oh, you're one of Jesus' disciples. Oh, no, no, I don't love you. I'm not one of his disciples. Oh, yes, you are. You talk like a Galilean. Your speech gives you away. Oh, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this Jesus. Right after saying, I will lay down my life for you, oh, confident Peter. Huh? Jesus said, you know what? You're going to have to learn a hard lesson. That if you are confident in yourself, you are not going to finish that. You're going to fall flat on your face. So when we see the, the cost of discipleship, it ought to cause us to say, Jesus, help me. <laughs> Jesus, give me the strength to not turn back, but to follow you all the way. But then there are other people who count the cost of following Jesus, and they foolishly conclude it ain't worth it. It isn't worth it. They don't want to die to their own desires. They don't want to be a servant. They want to take the comfortable road in life. And I wonder what this man did. We aren't told what he did. But it wouldn't surprise me if he just walked away because that's what most people did. They didn't think it was worth it to follow Jesus. They wanted to stay in their comfort zone. <laughs> Jesus says it's not going to be comfortable. It's the right thing to do. It's the best thing to do. And in light of eternity, it's the only choice you have to make. But you need to understand, it's not an easy road. And that's what Jesus wanted this man to understand. I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, just need to remember, this won't be in your comfort zone, there will be challenges along the way. There's a second man we see here that illustrates this principle. There is no turning back for the sake of earthly riches. So here, instead of volunteering to follow Jesus like the first man, Jesus commands him to follow Jesus, to follow him. Verse 59, he said to another, follow me. What was his response? But he said, Lord... Permit me first to go and bury my father. In other words, Jesus, I, I want to follow you, but there's something that I need to do first. Now, when you first read that, it's like, well, I mean, if his dad has died, you know, it'd be the respectful thing to go to the funeral, right? <laughs> I'm going I'm to follow you, but first I need to bury my father. Well, it seems reasonable. The Jews didn't practice embalming. A dead body was to be quickly buried. So it wouldn't take long for him to bury his father, and that would seem to be the respectful thing to do. 
But I would suggest to you that the problem with this man's request is that his father probably hadn't died yet. Who knows how long it would take before he followed Jesus. It could have been years before his father died. So it seems like a reasonable request may not have been all that reasonable. The Life Application Bible Commentary puts it this way. It is unlikely that the father was already dead and the son was merely asking permission to finish the funeral. Because if that were the case, the son would have been nowhere near Jesus. Hardly on the road where Jesus was walking because he would have been at home with the mourners. <laughs> yeah. And so John MacArthur says what this man was really saying was that he wanted to delay following Jesus until his father died and guess what? He received what? the inheritance. Ah, now that's interesting. I will come someday when dad is gone and I've received my inheritance, then Jesus, I will follow you. MacArthur says he knew that Jesus was moving out of the area and to leave now might cause him to lose out on his share of his father's estate. So what was the motivation here? It sounded good. Well, let me bury my father first. His father likely hadn't died. He was waiting for that inheritance. And then, once I get that money, then I'll follow you. That's kind of a common thing, isn't it? I've got too much to do now. I can't follow Jesus. I can't serve him now. I'm chasing after all the, the things of the world uh, to, to leave and to follow Jesus. What's, what, what's that going to mean? I might, I, might, I, might, I might be poor. And so there was the choice that this man was being asked to make, and evidently he chose the things of this world in its place of Jesus. The scripture warns us about this, 1 Timothy 6. Verses 9 and 10, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. And listen to this, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. <laughs> For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. That's why Jesus said no one can serve two masters, right? You can't serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And what's he talking about? He says you cannot serve God and wealth. God and money. God and riches. So there's the choice. And this man needed to make that choice. <laughs> well, well, first... Jesus, first let me accumulate a little bit, and then I'll come and follow me, follow you. It's interesting to notice Jesus' response. In verse 60, he says, Allow the dead to bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Now, what does he mean? Allow the dead to bury the dead. The first dead couldn't mean those who had physically died, right? It'd be kind of hard to do that. If you're already dead, you're going to bury the dead. So he's talking about something different. He's talking about those who are spiritually dead. And what Jesus is telling this man is that waiting for his father to die so he can get his share of the inheritance instead of following him is a sign of spiritual death. Because you're choosing something else other than Jesus. That's the spiritually dead. A sign that wealth was more important to him than Jesus. George Beverly Shea, recognize that name? He wrote the tune to the hymn, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. The words were written by Rhea Miller and George's mother. 
left the words of that poem on the piano. Ever done that as a parent? You just kind of leave something out so your uh, kid will see it, right? And maybe read it, and maybe their life will turn around. And so George saw the words of that song, or the words there. He started reading and thinking about those and wrote the tune for it. And God used those words to really change his life, to change the direction of his life. He was presented with a popular music career with NBC many years ago. But he chose instead to serve the Lord. And for many years, he was with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And you probably heard him <laughs> sing, one of the, sing this song at, at, at one of the crusades. And, and just listen to the words. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out of the comb. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything, anything, that this world affords today. That was George Beverly Shea's testimony. And he lived it. And so I'd ask you, is that your testimony today? Can you say, I'd rather have Jesus than anything? There's a lot of people that cannot answer that question, yes. Because they're chasing after all kinds of other things. It could be money, it could be fame, it could be fortune, whatever it is. And they have chosen instead of Jesus something that will not matter. What does Jesus say? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What will that matter when you stand before God one day, if you've chased after everything else and turned your back on Jesus, what will it matter then? It won't matter a bit. It's a foolish choice to choose anything else other than than Jesus. The third man, then we find at the end of this text, there is no turning back for the sake of earthly relationships. So like the second man who wanted to go and bury his father, the request of the third man also seems to be reasonable, huh? He just wants to say goodbye to his family. Verse 61. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Now, what could be so bad about that, huh? I just want to tell them goodbye. It won't take long, maybe just a couple hours, maybe, maybe a day. It won't be long. But Jesus responded quite firmly, didn't he? He said in verse 62, No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now that's a firm response, which would indicate that Jesus knew there was something wrong here. Jesus knew that in this man's heart, there was something that wasn't right. Jesus needed to teach this man that to follow him demands our utmost allegiance. To call him Lord means that he is the master of our lives. It means that we put Jesus first above everything, including our family. What did Jesus say in Matthew 10, 37? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now that's what Jesus said. And so to follow Jesus means that there's no other relationship that is more important to you than your relationship with Jesus. He is first and everybody else must line up under him. That's what it means to follow him. So as Jesus heard what this man said, uh, he saw in him a divided allegiance. The man wanted to serve the Lord, but not completely. There were other things that were too important in his life, one of which was his family. One author says his words reveal that his family ties were too strong for him to break away from them. Jesus knew that if he returned home, the impulse of the moment would die and he would never be able to leave. Like many people, fear of being away from or ostracized by his family would keep him from following the Lord. Now, I love my family. I love my wife. I love my children. I love my grandchildren, and I would think you would say the very same thing. But Jesus comes first, right? Jesus comes first. And if we put family, parents or children, before Jesus, that's not really following him. If we call him Lord, he is master of life. And Jesus says, he who loves father or mother, he who loves son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. And that's why Jesus responded to his request by saying that no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So whether it's earthly comfort, earthly riches, earthly relationships, they all must line up under the lordship of Jesus. That's what he calls, and that needs to be our response. So why would you give up all these things to follow Jesus? Do we even need to add, ask that question? <laughs> There's one simple reason, right? Because Jesus gave everything for you. He made the ultimate sacrifice for you. And what's interesting, we see this as we examine the context of our text. If you go back to verse 51 of this chapter, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Verse 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem was the place where he would give his life on the cross before he ascended back to the Father. It was in Jerusalem that Jesus would die for our sins. So in light of what Jesus would do to save them, he calls upon these men to follow him to Jerusalem. <laughs> Follow him to death. Not in the sense of us hanging on a cross and being crucified, but in dying, right? Dying to our own desires that we might follow Jesus. If anyone would follow me, what did Jesus say? Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's the pathway of death. It is dying to self, dying to our own plans, our own ambitions. We don't come to Jesus and say, here's what I like to do, okay? Right? You agree with me, right? That's what some do. Got my life all planned out. I know I need God in it. So Lord, you know, just put your stamp on this. Instead of surrendering and saying, Lord, you be the needle and I'll be the thread, like that one lady said, right? I will follow wherever you lead me. So I guess the question is, are we willing 
to die to our own desires? Are we willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads us? Young people, you're at a point in your life now, maybe wondering where, where does the Lord want me? What does he want me to do? Are you willing to say, Lord, you just lead me? And I'm willing to follow. I will die to my own desires that I might put you first in my life and I will follow you wherever you go. There was a chorus we used to sing in, the, in a different millennium back in the 1970s. After all he's done for me. Remember that one? After all he's done for me. How can I do less than give him my best? after all he's done for me. That's the foundation, right? It is what Jesus Christ has done for me. How can, I, how can my response be anything less than to say, Lord, here's my life. I'll follow you where you lead. It may not be the most comfortable road, but Lord, I'll follow you where you lead. No turning back. No turning back. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us today to recognize the cost of following you, that it is not an easy road, but the alternative, Lord, is would be so foolish to walk away from you like some of these men uh, likely did. Lord, help us to surrender. Help us, Lord, to cry out to you today and ask you, Lord, to help us to finish that race, to run until the day that Jesus calls us home, or until Jesus comes again. May you receive all the glory and all the honor, Lord, and I pray that our lives would be laid before you today. Follow you, Lord, wherever you lead us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Would you sing our closing song, I'll go where you want me to go.
benediction now may the grace of our lord and savior jesus christ the love of god the father the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen god bless you mm -hmm.